Uh, welcome, everybody. You can keep filing in, and they are, which is fantastic. I am Kirk Gutyar, the Managing Director of the Center of the American West, and I'm here to welcome you to the second Lunch with Limerick event um, featuring Jim Oxbury from the Western Governors Association, and it's called Bipartisanship Happens, How Western Governors Set an Example for the Nation's Leaders. Um, we have a few more of these coming up in the series. I just want to highlight them. On October 1st, we have Boston College historian Canaveri Valencius, Getting Sick and Getting Well, How Americans Have Understood Disease and Health. The day, the day right afterwards on Friday, October 2nd, Patty was quite prescient on this one. We planned this about a month ago, but it seems quite fitting for right now. Former Oregon Secretary of State Phil Keesling and CU Denver historian Cameron Blevins will be in discussion. The Post Office's Central Role in American Life, an advocate for 21st century voting by mail and a historian of 19th century U.S. Post get acquainted. Uh, so it's a quite pertinent topic. And then October 6th and October 13th, we have the Party of Practicality, an innovative and pragmatic conversation on immigration featuring uh, uh, historians Mary Mendoza and Thomas Jimenez and Congressman Joe Neguse, uh, at least for the October 6th one. So that will also be a quite interesting dynamic uh, program. I just want to let everybody know we are recording this. So if you do have to step out at some point, uh, know that by early next week, we will have it up on our website and you can review it or share it with other people if you like. Um, if we do have a Q&A button, we may not get to it because we've realized an hour is quite a short amount of time for the quite dynamic and interesting people we have on, on this program, but we still will be collecting them. So feel free to use that Q&A. Um, and uh, I, I think without further ado, I will present Patty Limerick and uh, she'll move forward with it. Well, thank you. Uh, this is really turning out to be quite a satisfying and meaningful experience, which if someone had told me a year ago that I would become a different person and feel totally fine about being on a screen chatting with me. <laughs> people, but I am totally fine with that. But I am glad that my, uh, my neighbor, Pat Wright, is, uh, is four blocks away. I think that still makes me think, oh, there is a here, and we, some people are in that here. So I first went to the Western Governors Association in 1990. Uh, I had written an essay in this book, um, Beyond the Mythic West, and I went to the picnic with the governors, and I got all these autographs from governors. Oh, and good heavens, and Jim Oxford has a copy, but you don't have all the governors oh. autographing yours, so I have a better copy. So, so I had such a good time, and it just turned me into, I'm not gonna say addict, that can't be the right word, but a person who just thought, I need to have more of this. I don't, I don't want to be separated from these folks who are carrying such a significant burden and opportunity as public public servants. So that converted me. I've done several things with Western Governors since then. I, I met Jim Ogsbury, the executive director now, pretty soon after he got here. And I will say my first impression was thinking, well, here is someone who seems to join me in a robust sense of humor. This is someone who seems to find things really uh, serious things sometimes, but with that edge of, of humor that that makes the serious things more manageable. So I was struck by that. Um, when we were thinking about interviews for this series, I thought about very fast, my mind went to Western Governors Association and to what I believe is, I'm gonna call it the most successful bipartisan organization of elected officials that exists in the country today. And that Im might imply that there's a long list and this would be the most, but I'm not totally certain. National Conference of State Legislators, I think I'd put that on there, but, but it's such a rarity and such a wonder to have such an organization so healthy and so robust and so capable of taking on very serious issues and staying in there um, and finding, well, the word problem solving can be a little bit of a cliche, but it's not a cliche there. They actually are doing that all the time. So when I said to myself, who would I like to have join me in this interview program? That was easy. Um, so here is Jim Ogsbury. He is the executive director of the Western Governors Association. He has in that, been in that office since 2012. He is, uh, if there's a way I'm not to say that, well, he is very much from Arizona. He is not a little bit from Arizona or partially from Arizona, really from Arizona. We'll talk more about that. Um, before he came to Western Governors Association, he was the legislative director of the League of Arizona Cities and Towns, equivalent to our Colorado Municipal League. Um, and that is 91 municipalities in the state of Arizona, and they are not 
interchangeable municipalities. They are very distinct and different, different uh, ecosystems, different economic systems. So bringing them into an organization and then speaking for them in the legislature was very good exercise for later activities. Uh, he also served in the federal government. He was, he was um, a subcommittee chief of staff on the subcommittee on energy and water development for the United States House of Representatives, the Committee on Appropriations. I wouldn't try to guess at how purposely he arranged the stages of his career, but working with the feds, working with the local municipalities, going on to the governors, it is as if you read the Federalist Papers as a six-year-old and thought, federalism, I'm organizing my life around the idea of federalism. So I wonder if any six-year-old has ever read the Federalist. Well, it probably wouldn't have been either of us. I can guess that. But at some point, uh, federalism really became the kind of let's put this all together thing for you. So it is really a great pleasure to introduce my friend, Jim Oxbury, who is um, an old hand with the Senate of the American West priority of strategies of when to use humor, when to not use humor, as well. And an enthusiastic storyteller who has spent eight years with a colorful, cast of characters at Western Governors Association and to have worked with those folks in dealing with a good number of the West's most compelling issues. So let's start um, with how did you come to be the executive director of WGA and that will probably require a moment or two spent in Arizona and how did you, well, how did you prepare or were you prepared by forces that just came upon you to become to become that person to become well, you, talk, you talked a little about my career director trajectory and I and I would submit that it has been an upward tra trajectory uh, because I'm at the pinnacle of uh, of, uh, of of of, of um, not bipartisan cooperative policy bliss at, at WGA it's it's I did spend uh, many years on Capitol Hill I was in Washington DC for about 18 years and and when I left, which was actually yeah, in the in the early 2000s, at that point it was uh, just so partisan and so and really toxic. And uh, all of my friends and acquaintances are still there, saying you didn't see anything. It is so much worse now uh, than it was then. And, and so I felt like it kind of died and went to policy heaven when I landed at WGA because I have spent my entire career uh, in and around politics and policy. And uh, I can say without fear of contradiction that Western governors are easily the most collegial, cooperative, bipartisan, thoughtful group of leaders that I've ever had the uh, honor to work for. And yes, it did all start in Arizona. I was born and raised in, uh, uh, well, I was born in Nogales and, and uh, raised in Phoenix. Um, and. Uh, uh, and I, I did make the uh, point when I made the, the um, a plea to the governors uh, that that I was a, a pretty uh, um, thoroughly Western stock. Uh, my dad was from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, he grew up in Spokane. He went to school at, in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, my mom was born and raised in Denver. Uh, all of my cousins are in uh, California. I've got uh, a, a sister in Oregon. Uh, so we kind of had the the, uh, the West covered, but but I also told them I, I I suggested there are a lot of different ways you can go with this hire. You could hire somebody uh, who is a um, association executive uh, who has that kind of experience, or you could uh, hire somebody who uh, has had a political pedigree, who's run for office, who kind of understands your um, uh, your challenges in your life a little bit. You could hire a policy professional, maybe somebody who worked on a uh, worked on the hill as a, as a subcommittee um, uh, staff director or you could hire me because I've done all of those things and and I did think it was a pretty good uh, uh, a pretty good grounding for um, my uh, uh, arrival at WGA. I think we might be enlisting you to give a uh, workshop to all of our students, uh, Southern American West students, on successful presentation of self at job interview. I think <laughs> our students would benefit from that. They have to have few achievements under their belt by that, but that's, that was quite, quite perfect. Um, so I wonder if you could, I've given my version of what I think is unique about, about Western Governors Association, but let's hear that from you. And what does set it apart? I mean, there are 
or a lot of associations of some kind or another organized around some office or political position or advocacy. So what makes uh, WGA different? Well, you, and, and you hit on this a little bit, Patty, but, but I, I think nobody has challenged me on this proposition, and that is that there is no other group of elected officials in the country who at their level of influence are producing and pursuing public, parties, public policy on a bipartisan basis as effectively as uh, Western governors. And, um, and, and you also mentioned kind of uh, th that they're fearless in, in, in tackling tough issues. I, I remember uh, when I first started in 2012, the first policy conversation that I was kind of airdropped into was about the Endangered Species Act. And I thought, wow, I, I thought this was supposed to be a bipartisan organization. I, I don't remember ever hearing a bipartisan conversation or, uh, around ESA. And, 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 and it was just fascinating watching the governors uh, operate because we went through 19 or 20 um, uh, versions of this, of this resolution on uh, ESA. And during that entire conversation, I never saw anybody throw a sharp elbow. And, and the governors were so respectful of each other. And so, um, and they listened to what one another had to say and they respected each other's uh, political imperatives and their opinions. And at the, at the end of this, this process, you'd think after you know, 20 versions of this resolution, it would be pretty washed out. But I thought it was a really potent resolution and it was potent mostly around the issue of state authority. Uh, and, and calling for uh, states to have more of a voice in the implementation of ESA and, and for the state use of, um, or, or for the use of state da data and analysis and science in, in making uh, determinations around uh, the act. And, and I think that's another thing that's unique about WGA and Western governors is this, com this fierce commitment to, to state authority, because that's something that binds them on a bipartisan basis is uh, you know, none of them want to be the red-headed bastard stepchild of the federal government. They all recognize that states have authorities, uh, constitutional authorities, delegated authorities, um, and and uh, just just practical imperatives that they they need to pursue. And and they've got so much to gain by cooperating and, and working with each other, and so little to gain by uh, fighting. And let's face it, they're not running against each other either. So that really kind of uh, help, helps the uh, 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 generate their cooperative spirit. So if it's not uncomfortable to speak of such a thing, uh, the other regions don't seem to have a comparable success in bringing governors together. Yeah, th that's true. Um, the, there have, I would have said when I started that probably the second most potent uh, regional governors association was in the Southern Governors Association. And uh, um, and in the meantime, the, uh, they dissolved. It dissolved, uh, I think, largely because they weren't pursuing bipartisan public policy. I don't know that there was the same level of collegiality uh, among the governors. And um, when they, they, they literally stopped doing policy, there wasn't much reason uh, uh, to carry on. There, there, there are uh, other regional uh, governors associations, but they don't have quite the uh, the footprint uh, or the the um, um, I, I think, uh, history of WGA. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the power of that sense of Western identity to hold things together? And maybe, as I understand it, you've had one or two public pro or a whole bunch of public programs at the conference where that's just explicit and the center of discussion. Yeah, th th there is something really special about being from the West and being a, a Westerner, and I think that that is. I'd say what, what the governors really value about WGA, that there are a lot of things they value, and, and, and they've all told us to kind of stick to your knitting and, and, and remain kind of a, a premier policy production uh, or organization. But I think they love the opportunity just to get together uh, and, and share with each other kind of their, their, their challenges and learn, learn from each other and talk about kind of their legislative um, uh, um, problems and, and uh, kind of learn from kind of what's coming around the bend um, and, and, and to have that kind of Western affinity. I mean, we've got all the public land states and I think I can kind of demonstrate this by anecdote and, and we, we've talked about this. There was 
uh, a, I mentioned the Southern Governors Association dissolved. Uh, there was a Southern governor who came to one of our meetings in Jackson Hole uh, and, and he loved the meeting and, and he uh, determined that he was going to make it his legacy uh, for his Southern state to become a, a member of WGA. And, and at first, uh, I, I, I thought it was pretty good news. You know, I could use the dues. I was all about, you know, world domination. And yeah, so, so come on in. I did not have one governor who in the final analysis uh, really wanted to expand the club to include uh, a, a, a Southern state. And, and I think that really spoke to the cultural identity that they all, all had with the West. I think they, you know, they recognized that from the Dakotas down to Texas, uh, this, this was untamed country. This is what we think of when we think of you know, rodeos and cowboys and, 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 uh, and the spirit of the West. And, and um, I think that has a lot to do with their, with their affinity toward one another. Can we just uh, have a quick, uh, not a side trip here, but uh, how did the tribes fit in that? Because certainly the West has the concentration of, of tribally sovereign lands and uh, self-governing people and so on. So how does that fit into that sense of Western distinctiveness? Uh, it, it fits in uh, you know, um, very closely. And, and I would say that for the first several years that I was at WGA, we weren't terribly, um, we, I, I'd say we hadn't really figured out the tribal relationship, and I still don't know that we have. Uh, we've been very, very focused on the state-federal relationship. Uh, we recognize that the tribes also, like states, are, are sovereigns. Uh, it has been difficult to kind of um, figure that relationship out because they are so, because they're so sovereign. And, and if, you spoke, if you speak to one tribe, you, you speak to one tribe. Uh, but I would say that, that on, over, over the last maybe 18 months, uh, we've been more active in that space than we had in the, the previous uh, eight years. And, and we've, we've done more to facilitate uh, conversations be, uh, be, between the region and tribes and, uh, and looking to do a lot more in, this in that space going ahead. Thank you uh, on that. So I am just wanting to ask, how you bring people into an organization that has a healthy culture and healthy way of by which people say hello to each other and don't uh, look for each other's weak planks and so on. Uh, that's not totally the tenor of politics. So how do you, and, and you had quite a turnover in the recent election. So how do you say, Welcome aboard. Oh, that, that's a great question, and and we uh, and we were we were really attentive to the um, election of 2018 because that's when we had really massive turnover. Uh, over half of our governors um, are new, newly elected or were newly elected in 2018. Uh, so it really was kind of like starting a new job because we didn't know these individuals, we didn't know their priorities, we didn't know how they would work with one another. We didn't know they like each other. Uh, but, but I think that, that we have the benefit of some very, uh, as, you, as you sort of suggested, a very strong institutional culture. And I think uh, our, our strategy for um, pulling the, this new crew of governors in, into the fold was to have such a strong reputation uh, that going into the 2018 elections, none of them could uh, help but know about WJ and hopefully would want to be uh, um, um, a participant. And I've actually had, I had a couple of governors, uh, a couple of candidates reach out to me during the 2018 election season, uh, not so much in preparation for becoming governor, but, but understanding that WG had a robust policy process and wanting to know more about the organization. I thought that they thought that would help make them a better candidate. Uh, so, so during that, uh, immediately after that election, we held a, uh, um, we cooperated with the National Governors Association and, and there was a new governor's um, um, orientation in, in Colorado Springs and uh, we had fantastic participation from our, our, our new governors and, and uh, I think the real key to it is, is to get them in the room together because you know, if you're a Western governor, your, your, your peer group is pretty small and you get eight to 10 of those uh, folks uh, talking together and, and they realize how 
uh, continent their challenges are and, and the, how much they, they have to learn from each other. And that's a real powerful force for cohesion. I, I want to, um, by the way, I just think there's something so wonderful, the story you told about the Southern governor. I just see him as sort of pressing his nose against the window. <laughs> be some place that's different from but and no, <laughs> see why no public lands and so on um, like the little match girl yeah that, that's exactly what i had in mind there. so um he probably wouldn't be flattered by that comparison <laughs> how could we resist that so i want to talk about how bi bipartisanship manifests itself uh, at any given occasion between well with the difference of not difference but moving from the personal to the policy uh, i have seen uh, actually, not at any event you were hosting, but in Denver a couple of years ago, I saw a uh, Republican governor from Nevada, Brian Sandoval, and jo uh, Democratic governor John Hickenlooper together in an event. And that was just one of those who could tell that there was a, supposed to be a chasm of partisan difference there. So I think that happens, as I understand it, pretty often that friendships form that people don't hide. I mean, I guess it is right. in a different world, they might try to conceal that they had such a friend, but this seems to be very forthright and even celebratory. So if you could talk about that personal level of goodwill and good nature and how that then carries over into a, a discussion where a resolution's getting written and there's different points of view in the room. Yeah, uh, for sure. I, I, I think a really good, um, Example of that is is uh, with Governor Bullock. I'll just go ahead and call him out. And in in Montana, um, you know, he's he's his neighboring state is Idaho. Uh, at the time, um, Governor Butch Otter was uh, the governor of, of Idaho, and 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 I remember um, Governor Bullock saying one of our events. You know, you, you look at Governor Bullock and you look at, at at me, and we've got nothing in common. You know, our, our backgrounds are different. Our our interests are different. Our, our politics are way different, and uh, but the, but you can't help but like Governor Otter, and I think that that they find a, a level of um, by forming those those friendships, they they gain a, a certain level of insulation uh, from political attacks during uh, um, um, you know by, by cross cross border um, um, members of the opposite party, uh, and and and. I would also point out that that selfsame uh, Governor Bullock w was asked to come and, and testify before Congress on uh, WGA's uh, bipartisan resolution on uh, in, in the Endangered Species Act and to do so with Governor um, uh, Meade. And uh, Governor Bullock has um, confessed that his, his staff said, don't do this. It's, it's, a, it's a trap. There's, there's just no um, there's no there's no upside for this and and uh, Governor Mead from Wyoming uh, looked Governor Bullock in the eye and said and said one thing I can promise you is that I have your back and and they they proceeded to testify before Congress uh, and they spoke with uh, folks on both the House and the Senate side and it was remarkable and it was it was like a clash of cultures because because the 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 the, the, the federal uh, representatives and senators were, were just so, so so accustomed to this blood sport politic that they couldn't quite know what to make of, the, of these of these uh, two governors who were just arm in arm and, and, and didn't and, and liked each other and that was apparent and they, and they, and they weren't uh, and they were not to be pulled off of, of what they had negotiated as a, as a very thoughtful, uh, policy position. So, so, so that, that manifests itself uh, time and time again. If you come to one of our uh, meetings, as you have, Patty, uh, there is there is no um, telling who is red and, and who is blue, uh, and there's such such great and goodwill. And, and it is a place, one of the, the, the rare places where bipartisanship happens. I I always try to uh, land very hard on the word ship when I speak that just to make sure that everyone gets how uh, what the cleverness is there but you just held it up and said it so maybe i don't have to be hitting so hard on that ship happened so okay good so good i've had an important lesson in enunciation on yeah. occasion here so um i'm wondering about busy people and time commitments and a governor's schedule can't 
have a lot of leisure in it with and governors can't be twiddling their thumbs thinking oh to find something else to do so how do you why or do you have to persuade them to make this time commitment or are they just making it without you having to persuade them how do, how do you get them wanting to invest time in this i i i think they almost universally recognize the value of coming together uh, particularly to promote change in Washington DC because because we're very much federally facing uh, we don't we don't do a lot of we, a lot of people will hear that I work for Western governors and they'll say oh well you must spend a lot of time in, in the legislatures well I don't spend any time in legislatures because we really don't work on uh, state issues or, or, or state policy because uh, again, the governors respect each other. They respect each other's autonomy, each other's sovereignty. So they're not going to go into California and, and tell you know, uh, the governor there, Governor Newsom, how he should be running a state. Rather, the beauty and the value of WGA is the ability to leverage their collective influence and their numbers uh, to, to change uh, federal policy. Uh, and so, and, and, and I think that, um, you know, it, and it's probably fair to say a lot of the smaller states have historically been uh, even more active because they recognize that the, they've got power in numbers. I, I remember one time we were in Washington and I had a, a group of, um, of uh, governors who, who represented smaller states and, and I had a, a senator uh, who, who, who was bold enough to say, well, why, why should we really be paying attention to you? Because you know, among you, you, you don't have a, you know, but a handful of electoral votes, and 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 the governor uh, in charge said, "No, the, the five people in this room uh, represent the governors of the 22 westernmost states. So we are, we, we you've got the entire West back here, which which is you know, geographically probably about two thirds of the country because we represent uh, all the states from the Dakotas uh, down to Texas and everything west of that, including uh, three Pacific territories." So that doesn't need to be, uh, they get it, they get it right from the start that this is uh, adding to their the legacy they will leave on earth. I mean, not well, to well, do this, but. Right, and, and another thing I just point out is, is that when we, uh, when the governors adopt a policy, uh, we represent that that is the policy of the Western governors, all the Western governors. Yeah, you know, not of course any governor can 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 uh, refute that or, or have have uh, his or her own uh, uh, take on that. But if we are representing that that's a governor's policy, then then there's a, a powerful incentive uh, for the governors to participate in the formulation of that policy. Uh, so every year uh, there's a chair, right. and it occurred to me uh, actually only an hour or so ago. I don't actually know how that works of how. Sure. A person who gets uh, designated as chair because there is quite an important role of choosing a theme. It's not just I call the meeting to order. Right, right. And uh, so, so the leadership of WGA is composed of a chair, a vice chair, and the immediate past chair. Uh, right now, uh, our chair is Governor Kate Brown of Oregon. Uh, our vice chair is Governor uh, Brad Little of Idaho, and our immediate past chair is Governor Doug Burgum of uh, North Dakota. So we alternate on a, on a party basis. Uh, the chair ascends to the, I'm sorry, the vice chair ascends to the chairmanship. So Governor Little will become chair uh, next summer. Um, and yeah, that is a, a powerful inducement to, to leadership is the ability that a chair has to commit a certain a significant measure of our resources to a particular uh, initiative or um, project or, 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 or policy effort. And these have become really, really big deals over the last uh, few years. Um, uh, Governor Mead of, of uh, Wyoming, it, that was his initiative on uh, uh, species conservation and the Endangered Species Act. Governor Ige uh, of Hawaii has had an incredibly impactful initiative on biosecurity and invasive species. Um, Governor, Governor Brown's current initiative is on uh, um, developing an electric vehicles roadmap for the West. Uh, and, and what really distinguishes these initiatives is they're, they're, they're not just big conversations. They're not just talk this. They drive to action. And you know, so for example, Governor Ige's initiative on uh, invasive species, 
that produced a new um, uh, policy resolution. We have a new council, uh, it's called the Western Invasive Species Council that is gubernatorially appointed that was an outgrowth of that initiative. We've developed new uh, data collection uh, protocols. Uh, we've got a data mobilization campaign that is going to, um, again, be an outgrowth of, of Governor uh, Ige's um, uh, work on this. Uh, uh, Governor um, Burgum of North Dakota had a particularly interesting initiative uh, over the last year called Reimagining the Rural West, uh, uh, based um, on the pillars of a community, a connectivity, and opportunity. And we, we expect that that, that really um, intensive focused effort uh, for that year, which also produced new policy, will have influence on, uh, on that issue and, and on our work product for years to come. So uh, how, given the state of disorder in the nation, that will just be my interpretation, uh, impression, how do you choose priorities or revise priorities or decide that you, one thing you could do for our disordered nation is hold steady to the priorities you already had or, or should you swerve over and save the nation in some way or is that, I mean, I'm <laughs> not putting this quite right, but the our priorities are very much um, firmly established by the governors. Uh, we've, we've made sure that the, the reins of leadership remain uh, entirely within their hands and we are a, a strictly policy resolution based organization. So the governors will go through, the, through a very um, uh, detailed process to negotiate the language of, of policy resolutions. Um, and once those are duly adopted and they require a bipartisan um, support and a super, a super majority uh, a vote for adoption. And once those um, are adopted, then, then we have, the, 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 those represent more than just policy statements, they represent basically our work plan. And there's a management directive that says, you know, WJ staff, you work with our offices to go get these policies implemented. And, and, and that might involve testifying before Congress or uh, um, commenting on proposed regulatory uh, rules or proposals uh, or developing coalitions and developing uh, implementation strategies. And, um, but, but, the, but, but those all derive from the governors and, and all the time they all have a lot of external parties saying, hey, you should be working on this or working on that. And, and my response is, that's a great idea. And as soon as your governor will start working on that, uh, because that's the only way uh, uh, to get kind of into our resolution making process is through the portal of a governor. Have you ever had uh, to leave a meeting room and follow a governor who had stormed out and ask him to storm back in or to come? I mean, <laughs> Or, or a five governors storming out or whatever. I mean, are there occasions where you really have to say, remember our conduct here or, or is that, well, who knows? I mean, uh, university. So th I may have that, that would be the, 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 the rarest of occasions. And no, I've never had to storm out that uh, after a governor. You must come to the university and help us sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> You're really good. We have a little bit more of a storming out tradition sometimes. <laughs> In our world, uh, okay. So uh, I want to I want to get to some of the um, first. Let's just do a thing on major achievements in the last well over whatever time period you'd like. Of what what's the on the record here for? Sure. Um, the, so the, the, the governors just have, have, have compiled a incredibly historic uh, and rich record of, of accomplishment over the years. Uh, WGA started in 1984 uh, as the, um, uh, upon the merger of two kind of related uh, governor policy organizations. And uh, it, ever since then, they've just um, um, had this mantra that they're, they're about getting things done. And one of the great things that they did uh, long before I arrived on the scene was establish Western Governors University. Uh, that that started as a, a, a WJ initiative 
uh, and it was a absolutely pioneering, groundbreaking um, uh, exercise in competency-based higher education. Now, of course, uh, th there are a lot of uh, higher learning that's, that's ton of higher learning now is online, uh, but, but uh, th that was a real um, uh, revolutionary model, particularly on the, the competen competency-based component of it. And that was all uh, due to a, um, um, Western governors saying this is, this is a need and, and, and a need that, that was especially uh, felt by uh, mid-career folks in, in their uh, communities that, that didn't have easy access to, to higher education. Um, Policy uh, uh, victories, um, too, too numerous to mention. The National Integrated Drought Information System, uh, which is a better way of, of uh, pre predicting and preparing for drought um, uh, emergencies, was a product of uh, Western governor's uh, ideation and advocacy. Um, in recent times, the, the National, Governor Bullock, his, when he was chair, his Initiative was called the Western Gov or I'm sorry, the, the yeah the Western Governor's National Forest and Rangeland Management Initiative. It contained this this very robust suite of statutory and regulatory recommendations, and about a third of the statutory recommendations were adopted by Congress and enacted into law within a year of their issuance by WGA. Uh, and and uh, some some of um, you all. May have heard of the issue of fire borrowing, where where uh, it was just this terrible um, uh, uh, circular practice of the the Forest Service stealing money from other accounts that would otherwise be used to prevent fires to actually go and fight the fires uh, because because uh, of the governor's advocacy uh, that was uh, a practice that was eliminated uh, two years ago. And the word stealing may not have been exactly the word you were looking for there. Uh, uh, appropriating, expropriating. <laughs> right. I mean, so, uh, so I want to go to a, a wider moment here of just asking you for your, uh, and I want to get back to, to what's next and so on for the organization, but just what are your two, I'm going to say pick two of your favorite, all-time favorite WGA experiences or moments and if two seems unbearable, then you can have three. <laughs> oh, man. It's hard. Um, uh, well, 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 OK, so one that I loved is uh, I mentioned Governor Otter uh, of, of Idaho. He has this really terrific um, a, a program that he started, actually, when he was a member of the House of Representatives, U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, and that he, he would do a trail ride. Uh, every year, and he would invite um, different thought leaders and and a lot of congressmen and and folks from the administration in Washington. And the idea was, gosh, you, you really don't understand some of these issues that we're dealing with, particularly with public lands. Um, and so, why don't you come out out to the West, and rather than talk about it in a conference room in Washington, we'll get on the back of a horse. And we'll uh, uh, we'll have a look, you know. We'll have a look at cheat grass, or we'll have a look at you know sage grouse habitat, or we'll have a look at uh, how state forests are managed vis-a-vis -vis, uh, federal forests. And and rather than, than uh, debriefing in a conference room, we'll de debrief around a campfire. And uh, I've I've been honored to uh, participate in a few of those events, and and uh, probably what you know one of my favorite moments. Well, it was pretty embarrassing at the time, but I but I rolled into camp. I, I didn't really realize how rough this country was, and I had a um, uh, a little rental car with two ply tires, and and uh, he noticed that one of the tires was was flat. And before I could say anything, he's directing people and get me a jack, and I need the uh, the, uh, the this pump. And and he's Governor Otter himself is on the ground lifting up my car, jacking it up, and changing the tire like. I, yeah, I'm kind of urban, but I know how to change a tire. You know, but but that you would have nothing to do with it. So so that was a fun moment. Um, and you you, you mentioned um, you know how the, how these governors kind of stand together. You know, I think another uh, favorite moment, or, or and, and there are several of these where, where um, I remember Governor Mead and Governor Hickenlooper of, of Colorado uh, 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 coming down and to to host 
one of these um, workshops on the Endangered Species Act. And, and to see them stand together, um, not just figuratively, but, but literally, and present that really powerful uh, um, message of bipartisanship, that framed, uh, I think, all of the, uh, the conversations to follow. And the, and the folks who were involved in those, in those discussions really did a great job of modeling the bipartisan ethos that had been exhibited by the governors. Um, I, you know, I, I, I love our, uh, uh, all of our meetings have been uh, fantastic. Um, um, and and just, just being on the, on the dais with the governors when they're just sharing such great camaraderie uh, is, is, is just an honor of the first order. So uh, speaking of a bunch of governors up on a dais there, could you tell us about how you introduced the governors, because uh, that's a lot of introductions and bios to read, if you were to read them. So how did you introduce the governors in December of 2017? And yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving into the zone of humor and its uh, usefulness in these circles. So. Yeah, you... no, gosh, I wish I, uh, so, so um, we started off, um, I think maybe my second meeting, well, my very first meeting at WGA, I, um, it was in, in November of 2012, it was the winter meeting, and, and I actually didn't know any of these governors, and I had just, uh, I just met them at the meeting at which I introduced them. So I, I remember um, uh, introducing Governor Otter, and I had known him a little bit in Congress. He was there uh, when I was uh, working on the Hill, and I made some comment about how I thought he was more comfortable in his, in his um, you know, uh, cowboy boots of Idaho than he'd ever been in his wingtips in, in Washington, D.C. And, and I came up, uh, he came up to me afterward and said, son, I, I got to tell you, I never owned a damn pair of wingtips in my life. You know, so, so at that point, I thought, well, I better get to know these governors, a, you know, a, a, a little bit better. And at, at, at my next uh, meeting, I tried to do something that was a little more, a little less standard, a little more colorful. Uh, and I think we used some, some videos, we've used imagery, and then uh, the, they ended up getting a little more uh, elaborate. And so it's, it's gotten to a point where the governors expect something a little more um, um, uh, thoughtful than, than reading a, 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 a thumbnail bio. So in 2017, uh, my wife, Christine, had suggested that we uh, um, maybe introduce the governors with song. And that really struck me as a, as a bad idea if I were doing the singing. She's got a beautiful voice. So I thought, okay, this is a great idea uh, for you to get up and, and maybe sing these gubernatorial introductions. And she said, if you think I'm doing that alone, you're, you're nuts. So I got dragooned into getting, uh, getting up on the dais. And the idea was we took uh, well-known Christmas songs and but we substituted uh, um, the lyrics with gubernatorial lyrics, and I and and that was 2017. I I hardly remember what I ate for breakfast. I don't remember the the songs that we sang, uh, but but uh, um, despite the, the my vocal challenges, Chris really uh, carried the day, and and it was it was pretty fun. And uh, you can sing the the first part with the Governor Hickenlooper. Yeah, we we think it looks like. Governor Hickenlooper, yeah, I, right. whatever. And, and, <laughs> and I would also like to say that as a member of the audience, a lot of us totally pitched in to help you. We were we had a, the PowerPoint slides and we were <laughs> hurling away over these resumes. So it was really it was totally totally fun. Uh, I wonder if I could ask on question of how much the lessons from WGA could be exported transplanted, subtly infused, or is it such a distinctive organization that that's not going to happen? No, I, you know, I think that's, that's our, that's our hope and that's our aspiration is the, is the, the bipartisanship that, that um, permeates WEJ is, is exportable. And, and I think the governors do that largely by modeling. Uh, you know, we try to promote the, uh, the organization and expose people to its ethos as, as frequently as we can, which is why we completely uh, welcome this opportunity to visit with you and, and, and we so appreciate your um, 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 uh, 
explication of, of what WJ is all about. And if, if uh, the, the listening audience has not read your blog uh, th this week uh, from the, Not My First Rodeo, it is fantastic. And I think it really um, communicates how potent and powerful and impactful uh, WGA can be. So please, please read that, that blog. Um, and you know, I, I think we need to do, do try to um, organize yet more uh, gubernatorial expeditions to Washington. So, so the, 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 those folks can be exposed to that, the, the nature of bipartisan governance. Um, but, but yeah, what's, we, we hope springs eternal. So I was wondering if you could do kind of a, a 10 commandments for problem solving in hard times. So I thought about that and then I thought mm -hmm. that's kind of a loaded phrase, 10 commandments. You could <laughs> push it around and you could do nine commandments and, and confuse people by what had happened to the 10th one there, I guess. But I also thought that uh, Stephen Covey left quite a heritage, just passed away, but the seven habits of effective people. So I'm not sure what has happened to his estate and who controls that that's a, quite a famous phrase, seven habits of effective people. And I wondered if you could maybe have seven habits of highly effective coalition builders and alliance maintainers or, or something that is, um, I, I guess with the internet, we wouldn't bother with print anymore, but it, it seemed as if that would be a way of, and maybe experimenting with different forms of that. But it, if, if I could say, oh, well, there's too many other groups stepping forward with examples like this, no need for you, that would be one thing. But I just, I just think, isn't there a way of making that uh, available? No, I, I think there's a lot of merit to that. And then, and then uh, also, uh, as, as you and I have discussed, uh, we have uh, initiated a book project. There is a, um, a Western Governors uh, Foundation, and, and they have uh, very much encouraged us to kind of memorialize uh, not only the accomplishments of Western governors, but, but communicate uh, those, the, 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 you know, the leadership potential that, that they have uh, successfully realized. Uh, and that is, is something that um, we, we, we the, 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 my first person research has stalled a little bit given the, the, uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, but but uh, we have a series. We've had a series of, of interviews with governors and and uh, former governors to 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 sush out. What, yeah, what is the secret sauce and and what what has been what what are the the elements to this cooperative engagement, this bipartisan um, um, mentality? And so we'll continue to do that and and uh, look forward to uh, publishing the results. Right, because when we last uh, talked about that book, bipartisanship happens and and interviews with all of these characters. I just, this makes me wonder, do you ever have reunions of the governors who are no longer in office? Um, well, so, so the, uh, I mentioned the Western Governors Foundation. It is uh, composed of uh, a, a mixture of former governors and current governors. And when the, that, uh, when the board members uh, gather for their, their quarterly meetings, it very much takes on the, the character of a reunion and the and the bonhomie and the, the 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 goodwill and the collegiality is is just comes back in, in full force. Right, and and the Western Governors Foundation is going to have not exactly a um, a scholarship program, but bringing young folks to the meetings is a possibility. We had a we had a meeting just uh, uh, this week uh, earlier this week where the where the governors. Um, decided to launch a Western Governors Leadership Institute. This is very, very much in the uh, earliest stages of, of um, conception, uh, but, but we, we definitely will be looking forward to bringing uh, young adults to, to um, uh, expose them to the, the Western Governors meetings. So I had a, uh, another bumper sticker that may not be, I don't know if it would work or not, but. I see it very clearly in my mind. It would be, it would say cooperation, then it would have the little uh, mathematical symbol for does not equal. So it would be cooperation with the doesn't equal uh, sign. Cooperation doesn't equal contamination. Right. Uh, I'd, I'd put that on my car in a minute. Okay. And you would be the ones uh, to prove that. So we have uh, a couple of things I wanted to bring up involving history, and that is that many of the states have state historians, 
and others don't. And uh, when I was the state historian, I tried an initiative of thinking that we might have an event at Western Governors where every governor would have to bring his or her historian and maybe they wouldn't have one, so they would create one. And then uh, some of the issues in my own circumstances, uh, relationship with it, with the sponsoring organization, not yours, but the other one didn't quite, quite work out. So that History Colorado didn't really get on board with that. But that's kind of a cool idea. And the Center of the American West is really proud to have a protege who was on this call, who is the state historian in Idaho now, Hannah Laurie Hine. So what do you think about that? And she is, uh, she does not have any of the obstacles that I had here. So there she is. She could, she's a very, she is so much better organized than I am. Uh, what do you think? Well, so, so I think uh, the governor showed their um, uh, interest in, in, in Western history uh, that manifested during the panel that you participated in, in uh, December, 2017. Uh, I think his history needs to inform, uh, you know, kind of the future, right? So, so uh, we can't, we can't get enough of that. So I, I look forward to uh, coordinating with you and, and uh, for, for future um, um, channels of, of input into the, into the governor's deliberations. Well, thank you. It is. It was really. I did have the three recruits last in 2017, and they are still exhilarated. I don't think they've stopped being exhilarated about that, about that visit. So I want to uh, talk about the educating of young folks to get them in the best position to do this kind of kind of work. And so Arizona to Harvard is an interesting transition. Uh, we had with us the. Uh, Harry Lewis from Harvard, who was your Dean of Students when you were there, which is kind of a using small world quality there. So I want to point out this really rather ridiculous coincidence that you could have taken my class. <laughs> your last year as a Harvard undergraduate was my first year as a Harvard professor, and I started my Western history class, but it met at eight o'clock in the morning, and maybe that was not the cup of tea there. But Yeah, that wouldn't work for me. No, no <laughs> it didn't work for very many people, as it turns out. So could you could you talk about um, higher ed, as you experienced it, as you see it happening, and, and Western Governors University in there, but what, what would you like to see happen in higher education to maximize the, uh, just the right opportunities and training for young people who would like to be in this world of bipartisan collaboration? Well, that's a, uh, that's a really interesting question, and one that I haven't given much thought to. I'll, I'll tell you that, that I think that um, uh, this institute is going to help answer that question because uh, the, the governors, uh, uh, frankly, and, and let me talk a little about the Western Governors Foundation. The Western Governors Foundation existed only as a passive financial arm of the association for 30 years. And the governor saw this opportunity to uh, reimagine the foundation as an authentic philanthropic arm of WGA. And and you know most foundations kind of start with their cause. You know they're going to attack childhood hunger, or they're going to help veterans, or they're going to protect animals. This one actually started with with the mechanism, this pre-existing foundation, and this opportunity, and the gravitas uh, uh, and the imprimatur of Western governors. But didn't really. But, but but I would say it's. I think it's fair to say we were kind of struggling for an identity. Um, and then uh, during this most recent meeting, I, th I think they've all really kind of coalesced around this idea of, of starting a leadership institute, because what is more associative with governors than, than leadership? And what is uh, um, a, a more important opportunity uh, for them to legal, leave a legacy than to train young people into these, uh, into these leadership opportunities? And, and that is uh, a topic of that's getting much more currency with Western governors now, uh, particularly that came up in the reimagining the rural West initiative of Governor Bergen, the, the, the importance of developing leadership capacity, particularly in uh, smaller communities. Uh, so, so I think that, that um, the, 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 the kind of quick and uh, easy way that the governors can, can be helpful is to expose these young people uh, who have an interest and, and a capacity uh, to uh, um, to their deliberations at um, um, you know at the Western Governors meetings, their formal meetings, and 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 we'll try to figure out some other ways to engage them as well. 
but as I said, we're kind of in the earliest stages of, of those conversations, but um, uh, I'll, I'll look for you to kind of help me think that through and answer that question that, would be that you great. posed. That would be a huge honor. Uh, okay, we only have a couple more minutes and I, I do want to get to what is next and the but I also want to point out what I forgot to point out when you were doing the stuff about your innovative ways of introducing the governors, you had a beer label for the governors, right? We did. Each governor had an appropriate uh, match to temperament beer label. That, and what, that, what did you do with uh, Governor Herbert from Utah, who might not have really wanted a beer? You know, I, I think at one point we had <laughs> contemplated uh um associating him with a non-alcoholic beer uh from from the great state of utah but i don't remember where we ended up with that we tried to be pretty illiterate alliterative you know, so we had gnome nitro stout and um you know, uh, 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 polis porter i remember that and uh um uh, 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 our next step, you asked what's next. You know, I, th I think our next step is to actually produce those beers and present them to the governors. That seems like an important next step. So, <laughs> okay, so we only have a couple more minutes, but where, uh, how has the, the WGA yeah. evolved or? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think one, um, one important way in which it's evolved is I would say that, that for a generation, WGA focused almost exclusively on resource issues. Um, and, and it kind of makes sense because that, 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 that's so, that so defines the uh, geography and, and, and geology and topography of, of the West are, are things like, you know, um, uh, forest fires and, and rangeland management and, and, and invasive species, endangered species. Uh, we've got uh, almost all of the public land states. So, so, so those are all um, uh, impacted by these uh, resource questions, uh, but I would say that, that a very dramatic uh, development in the last four or five years has been the uh, expansion of our footprint to involve uh, economic, socioeconomic issues. So, so now we have policy on trade, uh, on cybersecurity, on health care. Uh, I think the governors have recognized that uh, the model has worked uh, so well with with uh, these these resource issues that there's no reason that they can't work just as well with um, uh, uh, the, the more socio and economic issues. Uh, so so I think we'll we'll get ever more uh, involved in those issues um, uh, going ahead. So, uh, uh, Governor Brown Kate Brown has made electrical electric vehicles into her initiative, and uh, a less informed group than our audience would be thinking, well, that's going to be not an easy road to hoe with governors who, uh, well, Priuses are not necessarily their, their notion of a, of a good time or a good vehicle to have. Uh, pickup trucks are very associated with the rural West. We'll just start with that. And so how's that gonna go? And that's, that's actually what will be our closing question, I guess, but how will, uh, and I understand that the, the custom is, she's the chair and she has chosen this topic, so we'll all find our way of, being part of that, but does that topic seem like it's going to be bumpy or? I, I think it's fantastic because, because I think that, you know, to, the governors aren't afraid to tackle these, these issues where there are differences of opinion. And, 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 and this one in particular, this one's a little different from our um, uh, immediately preceding initiatives in that we're, we're, we're really trying to focus our conversations with uh, technical experts uh, and, and, and state um, transportation experts. And because there's, there's so much that we can accomplish with respect to um, uh, infrastructure and trying to regularize infrastructure and, and maybe uh, talk through policy regimes. So, so there's a little more unity uh, among the states. And that's why it's really called a roadmap. Uh, I, I think it's, it's more about uh, how, you know, when, when, you're, when you're driving your electric car from, uh, you know, Arizona to Nevada, what's that experience going to be like? Is it going to change in Nevada or is it going to be a, 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 a more consistent experience? Interesting. Uh, so, so I think there's a lot to talk about and, and it's, it's all about interstate cooperation. Well, 
thank you. That was a perfect answer. And for whatever reason, last um, Friday, we came to the subject that I have a Tesla. So I will mm. be your test case if I end up without a charge and somewhere between uh, Las Vegas and Reno, then <laughs> I'll know that we're still working on, on that. So Jim, thank you so much for doing yeah. that. Always a pleasure to be with you. And I get to be, because we can't hear these other people, I get to be the, I get to clap and I get to boop. So that, and I do that on behalf of them. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And, and thank you again for the, for the, the blog. If, if, if you, nobody remembers anything else, remember to go read Patty's blog. You can go to, uh, just put Center of the American West, not my first rodeo, and then the uh, Western Governors Association one posted today if you want to see that. And, and, and I think you do want to see that. So, okay, thank you so much. Thank you.